centuries before Columbus landed in America, a people lived by the shores of Lake Michigan, along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, and near the streams of the Great Plains. Only traces of these ancient Oneota cultures remain today. Today, archaeologists are searching for evidence of these people in order to understand their way of life. This Oneota potsherd is a thousand years old. Finding it, and others like it, led to the discovery of the Oneota Longhouse people. In 1970, an archaeological crew began working on the Hartley Terrace in northeastern Iowa. Almost a hundred years earlier, in 1882, the Smithsonian Institution had sent men to study the Hartley Terrace. They discovered 87 woodland burial mounds, later named the Lane Mound Group. The 1970 excavations of two of the mounds found disturbed ground, evidence of a rough trench made during the first exploration of the mounds. In 1882, workers scraped trenches through the mounds with a horse-drawn rake and a plow. There were burials in the mound which the early trench had missed. The woodland Indians often put their dead on scaffolds and later buried the bones in the mounds. These incomplete skeletons had no artifacts or pottery buried with them. As 10-foot squares were dug one by one to form trenches, the sequence of events became clearer. Oneota Indians had built a village at the edge of the older woodland mound was named the Grant Oneota Village after the landowner, Grant Hartley. Not all the Oneota sherds are alike. These are well known along the upper Iowa River. It is called the Alamakee trailed type because it was first found in Alamakee County. The thin line decorations are made by trailing a sharp bone awl across the pot. Dashes and rim notches were also made with a bone awl. The kind now found were cruder. These thick lines were probably made with an antler tool. They were named Grant type. This segment of the A trench is 10 feet wide and 50 feet long. Two storage pits were found in the subsoil few artifacts were uncovered. Although the A trench did not have clear evidence of an Oneota settlement, one crew continued the work. The ground was dampened with water and covered with plastic to soften the earth. The next day it was scraped again. Finally, the A trench was abandoned and refilled. Meanwhile, another crew was at work on the B trench day by day extending the squares eastward to the edge of the terrace. Storage pits were outlined. A fire hearth was found. Post molds appear as dark round circles, filled in holes where Indians set up house posts. The post molds were beginning to show house lines work in the B trench was paying off. The crew began to clear the back dirt away and new trenching began, following two major lines of post molds. Working during the hot summer days, it seemed that the post lines were never going to end. This trench is 90 feet long. At last, the post lines joined together in an oval end. But what lay between them? It was too large an area to clear with shovels. A bulldozer moved the back dirt and surface soil. Working with sharp-edged skimming shovels and trowels, hundreds of post molds were found. These were staked, mapped, and color-coded. This double row of blue stakes shows where a house wall had been rebuilt. 
new posts had been added where older ones had been set. The blue and red lines form a square corner. This was not a square house. It was formed by the foundation posts of one house crossing those of an earlier house. The extensive excavations revealed post outlines of huge oval-ended longhouses. These had been built, added to, rebuilt. When they were finally abandoned, other ones crossing the old foundation posts were set up. The white and yellow houses were built at different times. Both of these houses were about 25 feet wide and 65 feet long. The blue house had been added to and rebuilt. At one time, it was 90 feet long. Then the rains came. Six inches the first night after the stakes were laid out. Fortunately, the mapping had been completed. These huge longhouses were very different from the smaller oval-ended houses found at other Oneota sites. It was a very significant discovery. It was the first time huge Oneota longhouses had been found in the Upper Midwest. After finishing the excavation, samples of charcoal were sent to a radiocarbon laboratory. Radiocarbon dates showed that the village was probably settled somewhere between 980 and 1080 A.D., about 1,000 years ago. Evidence from the Grant site showed us where the stubs of posts had been set. What did these houses look like above ground? The French and American explorers visited longhouses that were much the same as the prehistoric Grant Village settlement. Let's listen to the explorers. Oui, messieurs et mesdemoiselles, our great leader, Sieur de la Salle, was murdered by mutineers, traitors among us, in the year of our Lord, 1687. Returning to Canada on the Mississippi River, we visited four villages of the Quapau. Their cottages are so very long and large that some of them can hold 200 persons belonging to several families. The round roofs are covered with the bark of trees. Mr. Secretary, gentlemen, I have the honor to report that following my instructions, I visited the Osage Indians on the Missouri River in August 1806. Osage lodges vary in length from 36 to 100 feet long. The Osage built them by first putting up a line of center posts approximately 12 feet apart and 20 feet high. Ridge poles are lashed to forks at the top. The side walls are a row of stakes about five feet in height, strengthened with three horizontal poles. Slender poles are bent and lashed between ridge and wall. The entire pole framework, both roof and sides, is covered with matting made of rushes. Each rush mat is two or three feet long and four feet wide and entirely excludes the rain. At one end of the lodge, there is a platform raised about three feet from the ground. This platform, which is for the master and his honorable guests, is covered with bearskins. These lodges are comfortable and pleasant summer habitations, but the Indians lead them to live in the woods during the winter. A respectfully submitted Zebulon Pike, Captain, United States Army. My name is Major George Sibley. In the summer of 1811, I visited the town of Kansa Indians. There were 128 lodges. Each lodge was about 60 feet long and 25 feet wide, covered with bark, mats, and heights. The lodges are erected pretty compactly together along paths, and between the lodges there is barely space for a man to pass between them. The paths are kept in tolerable decent order, and the villages on the whole rather neat and clean. The little patches of corn, beans, and pumpkins are seen in various directions around the village. I was traveling up the Mississippi by steamboat, of course, when I stopped off and visited Little Crow's Village in St. Paul, Minnesota Territory. It was 1849 in the month of May, and these Santee were still living in their winter teepees. When I saw them a week later, they'd moved into their larger summer bark lodges. The artist took the words of the explorers and illustrated their travels. 
It is much more difficult to illustrate prehistoric times, for we have no written records to follow. The ancient Oneota were probably ancestors of later Siouan tribes, like the Quapaw, Osage, Kenza, and Santee. Many details of Siouan lifeways appear in historical and ethnological records. The excavation at the Hartley Terrace suggests that four longhouses might have been set up at one time. Perhaps this was a summer village of about 200 people. Bringing together information from archaeology, ethnology, and history, we will attempt to portray Oneota village life on the Hartley Terrace. It's summer in the year 1000 A.D. Four clans live in our village, each in their own longhouse. I belong to the Turtle Clan. There are 14 families, over 80 people in our longhouse. My family lives in this compartment. There are sleeping benches and rush mat wall dividers. We are comfortable with all our possessions around us. My brother's family lives across the passageway. The women of our two families share the cook fire. We call our clan leader Great Father. He lives at the end of the house on the high platform. He inherited the position from his father only after proving himself worthy of that honor. The young men are now with him, learning the ceremonies of our clan. We have just come to our village from our winter camps and there is much work to do. The clan longhouses have been empty all winter and need repairs and changes. Temporary repairs are being made with rush mats. Bark needs to be dried and flattened for two moons before it can be used. The Fox Clan is smaller this year. Three of their men were killed by the enemy while hunting. Two women and several old people also died during the winter. No one wishes to live in a longhouse with vacant benches. The ghosts of the dead would live with you. The Fox Clan is pulling down one end of their longhouse to make it smaller. The Beaver Clan has prospered. None died and more children have come. Their men captured two women from the enemy. They are adding a section to their longhouse. Many people are absent from our summer village. Twenty men with a few women to cook hunt the buffalo to the west. Four more men live by the great river in a rock shelter to be nearer the fish. Our elders think we need a wooden stockade around our village like some tribes have. Our warriors think it would be a great deal of work for nothing. We have other things which must be done. In the fall, the village must disband and the clans divide. Each family moves off to a place in the valley. Hunting is easier without other families near us. My brother and I have moved our families into these lodges. They are much easier to heat than our drafty high-roofed longhouse. My wife has dried corn, pumpkins, and wild rice stored in pits and baskets along the wall. follow the tracks of the buffalo and other animals using our snowshoes. Winter hunting has been good, but it is lonely here and I'm looking forward to moving back into our village when summer comes. Nearly a thousand summers have come and gone since these people lived on the terrace. The longhouse people are but one kind of Oneota culture. Different Oneota cultures occurred from the plains of Kansas to the shores of Lake Michigan. The tribes did not call themselves Oneota, for this is a present-day archaeological term. <laughs>